I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist, and I recently had a patient whose head was on the pillow before they were about to go to sleep, and they looked at me and they said, Doc, I'm not going to have any dreams while I'm asleep under anesthesia, am I? And I said, don't worry, you're not going to have your sleep apnea nightmares. It's my job to make sure that does not happen. The patient looked at me and is like, how did you know I have nightmares when I sleep? And I said, sir, it was a man, I said, sir, you have sleep apnea, you have a high AHI score, you have severe sleep apnea, you likely have those choking, quicksand, drowning nightmares. He was like, oh my gosh, I never realized that. How did you know? Well, we're going to talk about that because it's very important because so many individuals have sleep apnea and when they're on the operating room table, it shows and when they sleep at night, it shows for very similar reasons. And you have to understand that we dream during, <coughs> excuse me, we dream during REM sleep. And when we're in REM sleep, there's some similarities to anesthesia because in REM sleep, your body is paralyzed. Did you know that? There are only two muscles in your body that are not paralyzed when you're in REM sleep. And whoever tells me what those two muscles are will get a massive shout out. Uh, Jody, hey, good to see you. I'm sorry that your sleep patterns are that disruptive. Jazar, shout out to you as well. But I want to know who can tell me the two muscles that are not paralyzed. Beetlejuice says diaphragm, you're right. And Phyllis says eyes. The two muscles, you're correct. Ocular muscles and the diaphragm. Because in rapid eye movement sleep, your ocular muscles, your eye muscles are still active. That's why you're moving your eyes around. And your diaphragm is still moving because you're breathing. The heart is still beating. You're totally right, Barbara. But we're not talking about cardiac muscle. We're talking about striated muscle that is under voluntary control. But very good point. What else happens in REM sleep, when your other muscles got paralyzed, your sleep apnea gets worse. It's just like when you're under anesthesia here on the table and you get medications like Profol. This also loosens up many of the muscles in your body. Now, when the muscles in your throat get loosened and laxed, you're more likely to snore. Like imagine right now, I'll do it just, you know, to be, <laughs> To be uh, straight up with you guys, if I just relax all the muscles in my mouth and I take a deep breath in, it makes a snoring sound, right? It sounds kind of gross and silly, but it's what happens in patients, especially when they're lying flat, like on the operating room table or at home. And when all these muscles are relaxed, like in REM sleep or under anesthesia, you are more likely to have that choking or gasping sensation. Additionally, the other muscles that are used to help you breathe, do you know what they are? And if you tell me the other muscles that we sometimes use to breathe, I will give you a shout out as well. But those other muscles turn off, which makes it harder to get enough oxygen. Darian, good to see you on there. <laughs> uh, I want to know who also, uh, who can tell me what other muscles are used to breathe? Because it's not just your diaphragm. Phyllis says abdominal muscles to an extent, but yes, EGF-1000 got it, intercostal muscles. Your intercostal muscles, which are the muscles between your ribs, intercostal, you know how we say entrecote for like steak? Cote is the word for rib, which in English we call cost, or the root, I guess, from Latin is cost. Intercostal, the muscles between ribs, intercostal muscles. So when you breathe through your chest, you see how my chest is moving? That is the action of my intercostal muscles. Those muscles in your chest turn off in REM sleep because of that REM atonia, just like with propofol to an extent. And that means that if your oxygen saturations are going to get lower, and I'll show you mine in a second, by the way, with the life support monitor here as I emulate that. But when you're having a REM sleep, which is when you dream, your breathing gets worse. This is really important because when you dream, your breathing is going to get worse. 
When you dream is when you're most likely to choke and gasp because of the atonia. So that patient, when I said dreams of quicksand, dreams of drowning, dreams of choking, gasping. And I even read a report once when a patient said they felt like they were lying in a coffin being buried. I don't mean to scare anyone, but the reality is that you're not alone. If you have ever had these dreams and you've woken up and you actually feel yourself snoring, it's similar to what can happen under anesthesia, except our job as your anesthesiologist, having hopefully walked you through this, is you know that we're going to make sure that you're breathing clearly without that gasping, choking, because that can lend itself into those nightmare-like states. And that can be so alarming that patients when they're sleeping, may not have restorative sleep. They might have worse PTSD because we know that nightmares have a close correlation and association with flashbacks and PTSD symptoms. Same with depression and anxiety. If you're in the operating room with me on this table, you are more likely to have a jumping, startling response that can actually be quite disruptive to your surgery. Multiple times I've had patients who are snoozing so, so smoothly along until they have a little bit of and then they suddenly jump. They're completely thrown out of their smooth slumber there because of how the brain responds to hypoxia. So speaking of hypoxia, let me connect myself to the monitor here. If you've ever had a sleep study before, you know that uh, they'll look at your oxygen saturation when you're sleeping at night. We do the same thing when you're asleep in the operating room. I do the same thing when a patient is getting ketamine from me in my ketamine infusion clinic. And even though you don't need to snore, like Jody says, you still can have these nightmares. So you're going to see my oxygen saturation here live here, 99%, so that's good. You can see my heart rate is 75, maybe I'm a little bit anxious speaking with you. CTJ is saying, how fast does the brain respond? When you are in REM sleep, your brain responds slower to the oxygen desaturation, meaning that you're more likely to be hypoxic or have a low number here for a longer period of time. The awake brain tends to respond faster to drops in oxygen. In fact, if I hold my breath, I can't even lower my oxygen saturation because my brain will force me to start breathing again. That's very different than when you're asleep in REM sleep while you're dreaming and when you're under anesthesia, for that matter. A little bit so with ketamine and psychedelics, but not as pronounced. So it's very important to recognize that your REM disrupted sleeping is going to contribute to those nightmares and the negative emotions experienced if you have sleep apnea, but also uh, the sleep architecture gets disrupted so that whenever you go into REM sleep, you're going to be coming out of it very fast and that impairs the dream formation. So not only if you have sleep apnea, are you prone to potentially having nightmares and negative emotional quality, but you're also prone to having disrupted dream formation in the first place. And you might not even remember what you dream at all. Uh, alethiometer says, now I'm utterly terrified. It's not about being terrified, but it's about understanding what's going on. Just like the patient, when I said, hey, I don't want you to be concerned about your nightmares because I'm going to help minimize that risk as much as I can. And that is a matter of being empowered, knowing that your experience is not alone, knowing why the experience is there in the first place. If you appreciate me talking about this <clears throat> after a long day in the operating room, I'd really appreciate if you shared with others what you learned to empower others to advocate for themselves in this broken healthcare system that we live in where clearly patients don't know what's going on in their bodies or their dreams. You know, dreams are just not a part of modern medicine and it's a shame that we don't acknowledge them because of how closely they correlate to our mental health. Um, if you could hit that share button, um, like button or subscribe to keep up with all my lives. I'd really appreciate that as well. As you know, I don't like to do any ads or product placement. I want this information to be out here for you to <laughs> learn to advocate for yourself. Uh, Titchy, can you tell me why I had a coughing fit under anesthesia? Yeah, it happens often when we have secretions, like spitballs that come up when we're sleeping and it can cause us to choke 
as if we have obstructive sleep apnea, even if we don't have obstructive sleep apnea? Very, very good question. Uh, I didn't follow, it's lots of comments here, and there was one about why uh, Jovan had good dreams. I can't tell you why you had good dreams, not knowing anything more about what you were thinking of before you fell asleep. So let's go on to the next topic about for sleep apnea, what can you do to have better dreams, have of less of that negative emotional content? Because it's very important. The more we use our CPAP machines, the less intense those gagging, quicksand, drowning-like sensations are and dream quality appears to improve. It's not 100% consistent, because not everyone has these types of vivid dreams, but they often do. Not always, but often. When we use CPAP, when we avoid other insults to our REM sleep, insulting <laughs> meaning medications or substances that can further disrupt our REM sleep, things like alcohol, marijuana, SSRIs, meaning selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, of which there are so many. Um, I'm talking about Zoloft, Prozac, etc. There's so many. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants are also, and another class of antidepressants are known REM sleep disruptors, meaning that they can further fracture your REM sleep, the period when your brain is actively dreaming. If you have sleep apnea and you have other REM sleep disruptors, it's probably not going to help the situation. There isn't a lot of data on this once again, because like we said, in modern Western medicine, we don't acknowledge dreams as a part of the healing solution to our problems. And this is why I'm sharing with you the secrets about how important our dreams are. Remember that our dreams do correlate with mental health, no question about that, especially anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Um, there was Two other, um, two other medications to be aware of, stimulants, so coffee, amphetamines, meth, these can all hypothetically disrupt our REM sleep. Another reason to be very mindful of any caffeine intake, not only before sleep, but also those individuals that are sensitive to caffeine, maybe a cup of coffee at 8 a.m. can impact their central nervous system 12 hours later, <clears throat> 12 hours later or so when they're going to sleep. And beta blockers, this is an interesting one. Individuals that take beta blockers, of which we use many in the operating room, by the way, probably might not help the concern for nightmares under anesthesia, though realistically, these are not lipophilic beta blockers. This is Esmolol here. Don't know if you can read that. We use labetalol. Oh, that's atropine, sorry. <laughs> but labetalol is another beta blocker that we use in the operating room. And the last one is metoprolol, which is also somewhere here, uh, which I can't find at the moment. Huh. Well, that's uh, when you're doing a live stream, <laughs> I put it on the spot, I guess. But lipophilic beta blockers, meaning that they're fat soluble, the most fat soluble one is called propranolol, which is why individuals with PTSD or phobias use propranolol preferentially preferentially instead of those ones that I showed you, those can cross the blood-brain barrier and it appears that those beta blockers can contribute to the beta blocker nightmares as well. So if you have sleep apnea, you probably have metabolic syndrome or you're more likely to. You probably have high blood pressure and you might be on a beta blocker. Recognize how one disease can cause another disease, which can cause medications to be prescribed for that disease, which can make another part of your health worse. So the sleep apnea, probably the high weight, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, now you're being treated with a beta blocker. Beta blockers are very good, they're life-saving, but if we don't need them or if we can avoid them, perhaps we can avoid the side effects that come with them, including these nightmares with beta blockers. So the last thing we've got to talk about, because this comes up all the time, is emergence delirium and what it has to do with these nightmares. So when you are waking up after anesthesia, you're on this table here, so many individuals wake up with very strong emotions, sometimes violent or hostile type behaviors, kicking, screaming, cussing, sometimes hurting themselves or hurting the doctors, the nurses, everyone else around them. Now, 
This hostile behavior can happen when a patient is in pain after their surgery or if, you guessed it, their oxygen saturation is low. Because these abnormalities in our blood oxygen, or ultimately our brain oxygenation, which is a function of our blood oxygen level, can lead us to do all sorts of unusual behaviors. Healthy healings, Chris, good to see you by the way. Um, and Nancy says she's had bad reactions to metoprolol. You're certainly not alone, Nancy. I totally condone beta blockers. They are life-saving in the right circumstances. But if we can prevent them from being needed, that's always a safer alternative. So when patients are waking up from anesthesia hypoxic, they can have violent or aggressive behaviors. What is the dream content like in patients with sleep apnea when they are hypoxic? It's more likely to have aggressive or hostile-like dreams. Do you see the resemblance here between anesthesia and sleep apnea and the effects it appears to have on our ch choking, gagging, uh, drowning sensations, and even our emotional status, our emotional <laughs> feelings? Very powerful connection that most individuals don't appreciate. Certainly not the patient that I started off telling you about. And that sense of lack of understanding or being too afraid to talk about your nightmares because it's like, oh, I don't want to be judged by my doctor in the office if I talk about my nightmares. That is very real. Nearly all of my patients are surprised to hear when I ask them about their dreams. They're like, doctor, why do you care? And it's like, I care because it might be one of the most important healing mechanisms you can tap into every night of your existence. I'll end by telling you, hey, that there is nothing in the world that is more discussed across all cultural lines, all periods of time, than dreams. From ancient Greece to ancient China to ancient India, ancient Middle East, the Americas, every culture in the world has recognized that dreams are peculiar and they have a huge impact on our brain and body. And in modern medicine, we look at everything. We look at your vitals in the monitor, all of the ventilator settings, but we don't ever talk about your dreams? How can we possibly ignore something that has been so central to the human experience for millennia, tens of thousands of years, and we just like completely forget about it? I see Gisela saying dreams are spiritual. You are absolutely correct that for many individuals, they perceive their dreams as a state of expansive consciousness. Like a psychedelic experience, when patients come to me for ketamine to heal in these profound ways from anxiety, depression, PTSD, or um, chronic pain, that state in ketamine, I always encourage patients to try to tap into that same expansive consciousness. Expansive consciousness. Every night when they're sleeping, if they're trained, if they train themselves, if they're compassionate enough with themselves to let themselves surrender to sleep. Just like when you're with me on the operating room table, if you can surrender to anesthesia and not fight the anesthesia, it is, in my experience, far more likely that you'll have a gentle sleep, a restorative anesthetic, restorative um, experience under anesthesia less likely to wake up with delirium, etc. The same goes for your sleep and for a psychedelic experience. Recognize that if we can surrender to ketamine, for example, it is so much more likely to take us to a healing space. And just like with our sleep, if we can surrender our need to be so attached to wakefulness and let the sleep take us where it wants to take us, we can have a powerful, a more, a more restorative experience. And this is what I guide my patients through on the operating room table or in my ketamine clinic. And certainly you can tap into this every night when you sleep. So if you have sleep apnea, avoid the benzodiazepines, the marijuana, all the other medications I talked about. Certainly try to use your CPAP as much as possible because that has been correlated to having better sleep quality and better dreams. So until next time, remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. And please share what you've learned with others. And if you hit that like button, it helps me do these lives for you more often. Please respond in the comments with uh, what you want to hear about in the next live and the next poll asking what you guys want to hear me talk about from the perspective of the unknown consciousness that we all experience in the operating room or uh, in our dreams at night. Till next time.